This video is brought to you by the Naval Institute Press. See the link in the description for more about the books of Paul Stilwell. And don't forget to pick up a copy of Battleship Commander, The Life of Vice Admiral Willis A. Lee Jr. If you want to learn about one of the U.S. Navy's finest battleship admirals, Hi, I'm Jack Russell of the United States Naval Institute, and today we have the honor of talking battleship with Paul Stilwell. Paul has worn many hats and has won many awards over his distinguished career in naval history. Paul is the author of numerous books and was the director of the history division at the Naval Institute for some 30 years. He served as the director of the Naval Institute's oral history program, editor-in-chief of Naval History Magazine, and managing editor of Proceedings Magazine. He also retired a commander in the U.S. Naval Reserve and served as an officer aboard Battleship New Jersey in the Vietnam War. Before we get into the interview, make sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and leave us a comment if you have any questions during the video. All right, now with that being said, let's get to the interview. So, Paul, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Jack. Yep, and a pleasure uh, for you to have joined us here for this today. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be back here in, um, in this space at the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center, and I appreciate uh, Naval Institute Press for uh, allowing me to, to do this sort of things and to, to have our uh, distinguished authors uh, in for these types of interviews. So, um, Paul, um, I, I've briefly introduced you in the, uh, in the opening of the video, but if you would, if you would talk about yourself just a little bit um, and sort of let the audience know uh, who you are. Well, thank you, Jack. I've feel that the Naval Institute is a very special place to me because I joined the staff in March of 1974, so 50 years and counting. Mm -hmm. Before that, uh, I grew up in Missouri, a St. Louis Cardinals fan to the core. I'm sure it's in my DNA now. Mm -hmm. And in uh, 1962, I turned 18, had to register for the draft, and Vietnam was not even a cloud on the horizon at that point. So people weren't trying to escape anything. Mm -hmm. But my dad was a former merchant marine officer, and he steered my brother and me to the Naval Reserve. Mm -hmm. And it was really convenient. So all through college, I, I drilled every Thursday night at the Reserve Center. And then I got commissioned when I graduated. I had gone to officer candidate school in summer vacations. And lo and behold, uh, the first orders I got took me to a ship home ported in Yokosuka, Japan. And I thought, this is no longer quite as convenient as two and a half blocks from home. <laughs> no, not quite. And by then, Vietnam was an issue in 1966. Mm -hmm. And my ship made frequent uh, voyages there. Edmiral and Tom Cutler came out with a, a book uh, 2023, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the U.S. combat operations in Vietnam, because yeah. it stopped in 1973. That's a Brownwater War at 50, their most, their most recent book. Exactly. Yeah. And I was flattered to be asked to contribute a chapter. And so my ship did indeed go into the brown water in late 1968. Mm -hmm. We were the mothership for swift boats and Coast Guard WPBs going into the rivers. Mm -hmm. And sadly, a number of them got shot up, had to ask for medevac helicopters to come in and take the wounded away. Mm -hmm. And sadly, in one case, it was a young Coast Guard guardsman who died. And the captain uh, made it available for members of the ship's crew to go on these boat patrols. Uh, it wasn't mandatory, but highly encouraged. The idea being that the ship's crew would have a greater appreciation for what the boat crews were sure. doing. Mm -hmm. Well, on this particular day that I went, the sun was shining, beautiful day. We went up a river and ran into a wooden trellis. It was all the way across the river. Mm -hmm. Would have been a perfect ambush site because the boat would have had to turn around and come yeah. back out. Uh, fortunately, the Viet Cong took that day off, and I'm glad to let them have their R&R &R that day. There you go. But while I was on board the Washoe County, I, I became entranced by the news of the battleship New Jersey mm -hmm. coming out. 
And so I put in an application uh, to be reassigned to the New Jersey. And occasionally in life, you get really lucky. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the captain had an inflated op opinion of my worthiness and gave me a spectacular fitness, fitness report. There you go. <laughs> so I got assigned to the New Jersey. That's incredible. And I will say it, it was the most enjoyable job I've ever had in my life. And I've had several that were enjoyable. So for the, the viewers, so for a lot of our viewers, um, they're very familiar with Mr. Zizmanski, Ryan, and Battleship New Jersey. But you were lucky enough to serve aboard, aboard her in Vietnam, unlike, uh, you know, versus just being a static museum piece. So, Well, I reported to the ship just after she got back from Vietnam. Okay. And it was such a treat. Every day you get up and here's a ship that so many people admire. Sometimes we'd have hundreds or thousands of visitors. Mm -hmm. And I think, gee, I get to live here every day. Absolutely. So in the summer of 1969, we made a wonderful midshipman cruise. We went to Tacoma, Washington, went out to Pearl Harbor. And on the day of the first moonwalk, July 20th, 1969, I watched Neil Armstrong step off uh, on the lifeguards television set at Waikiki Beach. Wow. So then we came back to San Diego, mm -hmm. then to Long Beach. And we had trained all summer before the cruise, getting ready mm -hmm. to go shoot in Vietnam. And two weeks before we were to leave came the word that you're not going. The ship's going to be decommissioned instead. Mm, okay. And the motto of the ship was and is firepower for freedom. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the change of command, Captain Ed Snyder said, "War has it's been said that war is hell, but war is also expensive. Yep. And the American taxpayers have tired of the cost of paying for mm -hmm. firepower for freedom. So there was just gloom throughout the ship. Mm. But I found out after that how lucky I was that that happened. Mm -hmm. You never know in life. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, it is really incredible because New Jersey, of course, is the only battleship recommissioned for that, that particular conflict. And uh, while the others, you know, so you, know, you have four Iowa class battleships and the other three are still in mothballs, you know, and so you're right. It is very expensive. And uh, to have New Jersey brought back out, um, would you, your time when you served a, um, aboard New Jersey, what was what were you actually doing? What was your your, your job, so to speak? You know? I was the assistant combat information center, so mm -hmm. stood watches uh, in CIC, and so we get reports from topside. Well, the seas are so and so. We're going under the Golden Gate Bridge, and what mm -hmm. have you, and. I saw none of that. I saw the radar scope. I think you had mentioned to me one time, um, you never even saw them fire the guns. I, I did not when mm -hmm. I was in the crew. Right. Later, I went back on board mm -hmm. to research my history of the ship. Mm -hmm. And only then mm -hmm. did I get to see the guns fire, which is spectacular. And what, what year was, was that? That would have been in the 80s at some point? 1983. Okay, 1983. Okay. But inside, when, so when you're inside the ship, down in, um, at, your, at your post there, and they fired the guns. Did, did you feel it? Did you hear it? What's, the, what's that separation like? It was very faint because yeah. CIC was inside the armored box. Yep. So you've got a lot of steel between you and the guns. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to continue on the, the luck part. Mm -hmm. I went to the ship's decommissioning in... Bremerton, Washington, December 17th, 1969. It was a gray, overcast day, sort of fitting the mood. And the captain was uh, Robert Penniston. And in his farewell speech, he said, New Jersey, rest well, mm -hmm. yet sleep lightly, and hear the call if it again comes to mm -hmm. provide firepower for freedom. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, because the ship had not gone to Vietnam a second time, I met my future wife on a blind date. 
So that did work out. It worked out <laughs> tremendously. And I really doubt that she would have been in Vietnam. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So w w what an incredible story there. Now, New Jersey, though, not your first battleship. No, it was not. Yeah. What, 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 what was your first battleship? Well, this may come as a surprise. Of course, there were no commissioned battleships mm -hmm. uh, when I was on active duty. Our ship, the Washoe County, was based in Yokosuka, Japan. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a great home port, and you had access to Tokyo and all of that. But I walked around the base there sometimes, mm -hmm. and there encased in concrete was the Japanese battleship Mikasa. Mm -hmm which was the flagship for Admiral Togo in the Battle of Tsushima Strait in May mm -hmm. 1905. And that was the final battle in the Russo-Japanese War. And out of all people, Teddy Roosevelt, who was then the president, negotiated the peace treaty in the Navy Yard at Portsmouth, New <laughs> Hampshire. And I have since visited that naval shipyard mm -hmm. and been in the room where the peace wow. treaty was negotiated. So it, that's, I was, so truth be told, I was not expecting you to say that. <laughs> I was expecting you to say like, you know, like you had visited um, like Missouri or, or something like that in mothballs. I, I don't know why, but that that's actually incredible that you've actually been and seen Mikasa. Um, and it's interesting that ship um, surviving the World War II occupation and everything and, you know, the, occupying U.S. forces, keeping that intact for, you know, the history of, of Japan and everything and uh, the fact that it's still around today. I mean, how, how, how rare are vessels from that time period and to be able to, to have that there, that's, that's pretty incredible. Well, I, th I think about the only contemporary mm -hmm. is the Olympia, which is mm -hmm. up at Philadelphia. She was in the Spanish-American War. Right. But I, I did... On a busman's holiday, when the New Jersey was on the midshipman cruise, I go visit Bremerton and went aboard the Missouri, which was my home state. So that was a treat. And the sponsor of the ship was Margaret Truman, mm -hmm. daughter of President Harry Truman. When I was just out of the second grade in 1952, Harry Truman came to our city, Springfield, Missouri, for a reunion with his World War I Army buddies. So... I saw the president marching mm -hmm. down the main street in Springfield, Missouri. And later, for the book I wrote about the Missouri, I interviewed his daughter. Mm -hmm. And she was as feisty as wow. he. <laughs> <laughs> so you've written a number of books about battleships. Yes. Um, where does that love come from? It came from those five months I spent in the crew of the New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And a lot of luck uh, when I... Got off active duty, I went to journalism school at the University of Missouri and had to have a thesis topic for my master's degree. Mm -hmm. So I decided to write about the Navy public relations and news media coverage of the New Jersey hmm. during the Vietnam period. And I needed a thesis committee, and one of them had to be a naval officer. Well, of all things, uh, in 1972, I was at home reading an issue of Naval Institute Proceedings, and there was a, an article mm -hmm. um, by Captain Paul Schratz that won one of the prize essay mm -hmm. uh, winners. And it said in his bio that he taught at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. There you go. So I went to visit him. Mm -hmm. And... We got to know each other, and he said, I, I would like to be on your committee, but I'm going to move to Annapolis, so sorry I can't do that. Well, I had a job for two seasons uh, as an assistant PR man for the St. Louis Football Cardinals. So I, I had intended mm -hmm. to be a sports writer. So That's what you, that's what you went to school for? Or, it, yes, 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 journalism that's right. school. Yeah, right, journalism school. And I got fired after two seasons because I asked the boss for a raise, the notorious tightwad, <laughs> Bill Bidwell. Oops. So mm -hmm. there I am in the early 1974 mm -hmm. looking for a job. Mm -hmm. 
I had an interview to write and take photos for a house organ for a shoe company. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I couldn't use the best story that the shoe salesman told me. Uh, he was telling about incidents from shoe salesmanship. Okay. He said, one time I was uh, fitting a lady, and, and she was kind of chubby, and I have a bald head. And as I reached forward, she pulled her skirt over my head. <laughs> and I thought, well, I can't even put that in the I can't story. Use that, unfortunately. Yeah. So fortunately, this is the good luck again. Mm -hmm. I sent a bunch of resumes to Captain Schratz in Annapolis because mm -hmm. my wife and I had visited here in 1972 and really liked the area. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, one of them wound up uh, at the proceedings when there was an opening for an assistant editor. And that started my 50 years association with the Institute. And then so you worked through, um, you became what, um, proceedings editor, like the in chief or which? What was your highest role at proceedings, Paul? I'm sorry. I was the managing editor. Managing editor. Okay. <laughs> sorry. And then... Mm -hmm. I got an offer I couldn't refuse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was very much interested in oral history because I had done interviews for my thesis. And uh, John Mason, who was the founder of the program, was retiring. And the editor of the annual Naval Review issue of Proceedings was going to the Naval War College to, to edit the War College Review. Mm -hmm. So I relieved both of them. And I had two jobs. And Mm -hmm. kind of splitting between the two. But I found out I just loved oral history. You go to the horse's mouth and, right. and get the story. Hear the stories directly from the source. So, um, and then and then you turned your attention, or at the time then you started to look into the, the, the big battleship books that would ultimately uh, come out with Naval Institute Press over the years. Well, let me back up a little on okay. that, Jack. When I was on board the New Jersey, I intellectually curious or whatever you call it. I mm -hmm. was looking through the World War II cruise book for the New Jersey and found that there were four embarked flag officers, mm -hmm. uh, Admiral Halsey and Admiral Spruins, who are well known, mm -hmm. Oscar Badger, less well known, and Willis Lee, hardly known at all. Mm -hmm. So in 1975, the year after I joined the staff, I thought, I would like to write about Willis Lee. So I went over to see the director of naval history, uh, Vice Admiral Ed Hooper, who said he encouraged me greatly because he had been a shipmate with Admiral Lee, especially during the great battle off Guadalcanal in mm -hmm. 1942. So I started the research and got some lucky breaks. Uh, there was a man in Ohio who had mm -hmm been doing research earlier and written to Lee's classmates and what have you. And so he died and I, I kept running across mm -hmm. his name mm -hmm. and found uh, an address in a Cincinnati phone book. So I sent a letter there and it was forwarded to his widow who lived in Versailles, Kentucky, not wow. Versailles, but Versailles. Gotcha. And she had, all the material on Lee that her husband had collected before he died. Wow. And she turned it over to me, no strings attached. Incredible. And yeah. she said, I, I wondered mm -hmm. what to do with all this material. And then I got the, your letter and that was the answer. Wow. And she had stuff that I could not possibly have gotten because the, the people who wrote to him in the 60s were mostly all dead. Mm -hmm. by the 70s. And so then this work then starts you up down the battleship interest path. And meanwhile, you so the, the, the biography of Admiral Lee is, is your is your life work. It's again, going back to the 70s in this case, right? <laughs> and then, um, well, and then the, the book came out in mm -hmm. uh, 2021. Right. Mm -hmm. And people would ask the obvious question. Paul, oh, what took you what so, took long? so long? And I said, well, 12 other books intervened. Yeah, you know, I think that's that's a fair <laughs> excuse, right? And my youngest son overheard that and said, oh, I just hate it when that happens. <laughs> now, 
um, Battleship Commander, the the, the Lee bio, um, uh, you won Author of the Year for that. Um, uh, was it 2000? The book came out in fall of 2021, and I think you that you received that the next May and yes. the next the, the pre, in 2022. Um, that's a that is a wonderful book. Um, is there so in, in between Battleship Commander? So then you have your big illustrated history books. And have you, you've written other works too, but yes. um, as this is a um, uh, battleship focused interview here, we're gonna we're we're, we're gonna focus on those. So you've done um, you've done a book on Missouri, and obviously New Jersey, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. And uh, Arizona, and I'm missing. I, had, I did a for Barnes and Noble. I did mm-hmm. a coffee table book Mm -hmm. uh, on the history of U.S. battleships. Okay, yeah. But let me throw in a plug Mm -hmm. for my favorite book, Mm -hmm. and this surpasses even the Lee book. Okay. Uh, When I was doing oral history, and again, this is a matter of luck, Mm -hmm. a young lieutenant came in from Great Lakes, Illinois, and he was pushing for publicity for a reunion of black World War II sailors who had trained at Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And he had with him a list of the eight surviving members of the Golden 13, who were the first black naval Mm -hmm. officers commissioned in 1944. And it just lit a fire because my dad, Mm -hmm. who was a preacher uh, in Ohio when I was born, Mm -hmm. and he preached on racial tolerance and understanding. And a member of his congregation came to him and said, we're tired of that stuff. Just mm-hmm. knock it off. So as an object lesson on my first birthday, he had a black minister from Dayton come in and baptize me in front of the congregation. Wow. Sort of an in-your-face statement. Mm-hmm. This is what I believe. Sure. And when we moved to Missouri, he would give talks about the scientist George Washington Carver from mm-hmm. Tuskegee. He took us to place in Diamond, Missouri, where Carver had been born as a slave, Mm -hmm. this rubs off on you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, the the book uh, Paul's talking about is Golden 13, which is still, um, it's in paperback, but it's still in in print with uh, the Naval Institute Press today. I've interviewed Mm -hmm. the eight surviving members, Mm -hmm. three white men who had served with them. And after I Going all around the circuit, I thought, gee, I wish I had known when I talked to number two what number seven told me. Right. Well, I liked the guys so well, then I went all the way around the circuit again. Mm -hmm. And some of them were more candid at that point Mm -hmm. because I had shared each man's interviews with everybody else. Mm -hmm. So the the first time they might have said or thought they didn't say it. Mm-hmm. Who is this honky and what does he really want? <laughs> By the second time, they were they a little trusted, looser. And, they trusted yeah, me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, no, that's, that's, I had never actually heard that, Paul. So that, that's a bit of information that I, I hadn't even heard about you in the past. So that's, that's wonderful. Well, it's very satisfying because mm-hmm. otherwise their stories would have gone to the graves with me. Right. As did those of the five mm-hmm. who didn't survive till I did the interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, the New Jersey book. I, I, I don't. I don't want to steer you away here. That's a labor of love. Uh, so, uh, so you originally uh, produced um, your, your illustrated your history of um, of New Jersey, and that was about in the eighties. And so you're missing the last few years of the ship's career, and then ultimately it's uh, you know decommissioning mothballs museum ship, and then up to up to today. Um, is there anything, um, is there anything you'd like to share about the original version of that book about, you know, your, your, your process getting to there, what that meant to you, um, being a a veteran of of the ship and now you get to to write a book on it? Well, it was a real treat Mm -hmm. interviewing people who had served in the ship all the way back to the original crew, uh, commissioned in 1943. Mm -hmm. And there was instant rapport because I had served in the ship. Sure. 
it was as if we had all dated the same girl and we were <laughs> comparing notes. <laughs> right. Was there anything that surprised you or was anything unusual when you were doing your research? Um, any any fun stories that you can you can think of? Um, well, there are a lot of fun stories of New Jersey in uh, early 44 went through the Panama Canal to on the way to the war zone for her first combat. Mm -hmm. And it went, some of the guys went to a kind of raunchy Liberty joint in Panama. And some of the guys from other ships were mistreating this woman who was putting on an act. Mm -hmm. And a big fight broke out. And afterward, the guy had a smile on his face and he said, I've been in a lot of barroom fights that's the only one I can remember, but I knew what caused it. <laughs> now, um, okay, so the, you're you're revising that book now, the your New Jersey book. So that's that's the new one that's that's coming out here um, in 2025. That's what we have uh, scheduled for anyway, right? <laughs> um, is there anything um, so? We, we, so just fill us in, uh, Paul, um, as far as the the last couple of years and um, and then what what have you done in, in the research? Um, have you found to, in, to get us back to modern times? So like what, what what's the revision of the book include and, and, and what, what have you found? Anything? Well, I have to take hats off and render a, a salute to Ryan Zemanski, mm -hmm. who's the curator and historian at the battleship mm -hmm. and he is just amazingly energetic and knowledgeable and helpful for example he provided me with copies of some of the ship's annual histories mm -hmm. turned out i had a few he didn't so it was a nice swap mm -hmm. and i was just going through one the other night and came across a murder that had been committed on board really and some seamen had been beaten up, un knocked unconscious, mm -hmm. and put on top of a dumbwaiter that carried food up and down. Okay. And he died without regaining consciousness. Really? And in the ship's history, it told about uh, there was an investigation and they believed that one man was responsible. But they couldn't find enough evidence to sure. take him to court martial. Mm -hmm. So I asked Ryan about this, and he said there were probably several involved. Right. But there's he's gotten so many answers on what happened. Mm -hmm. He said, just go with the official history because I've got a, a bunch of rumors. Mm -hmm. And the official ship's history is fine as a framework, but talking to the former crew members is the neat part right and but that but that again that, that is your special your speciality the talking because of the, your oral history background um was there a lot of have you done a lot of interviews with the the crew members um both for the previous version and have you been able to contact any now i went to the ship's reunion in uh, mm -hmm. 2023 in charleston south mm -hmm. carolina and there were half a dozen men who had been in the crew in the 1980s mm -hmm. and i have more interviews to do including with retired captain craig kennedy mm -hmm. when i was uh, standing watches in cic in 1969 i was actually sitting watches the next in the next chair to me was ensign craig kennedy who had just gotten commissioned as an ensign just gotten married mm -hmm. I went back to visit the ship in 1987, and Craig Kennedy was there as the operations officer, commander. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be in touch with him to get the updated version. I had done an oral history interview with Captain Lou Glenn, who had been flag lieutenant for Admiral Elmo Zumwalt in Vietnam. And later he was the executive assistant to Vice Admiral Joe Metcalf, who was the Pope, if you will, of mm -hmm. surface warfare in the Pentagon. So then this 
EA goes and becomes commanding officer of the New Jersey. So I visited, we had a, a great reunion. Some of the crew members had been extras in the filming of War and Remembrance, mm -hmm. Herman Wolk's epic history of World War II. And he showed me a picture of himself in a vice admiral's uniform. Mm -hmm. Sadly, that year, Captain Glenn was helping his son deliver papers on a Sunday morning. And he double parked while his son went in with the paper. And a truck rammed him from behind. Uh, the truck driver had dropped something and looked down wow. and didn't see the car in front of him. And the collision was so tremendous that Glenn had to be pried out of the ship. He was in the car. He was trapped in the car. Wow. And took a while to get mm -hmm. back in battery, mm -hmm. eventually recovered uh, and became a rear admiral. Mm -hmm. But it's very likely that his life was shortened by just that one instance of trying to be a, a good neighbor and wow. helping his son. Um, okay. Um, you know, I was, um, I was on New Jersey uh, this last Thursday. I drove up and, and saw Ryan and uh, we did, uh, we did some, um, uh, a few episodes of the, the, the show we do together. Um, and it's just really amazing all the work right now that's going on as they're getting into dry dock or heading towards dry dock that is um, and of course by the time um, by the time your book comes out uh, that will have already happened are you um, are you going to include try to include any of that information in this book um, just Ryan was under you know the impression that as long as everything checks out okay it's not like the ship will need major repairs um, but as are you hoping to include some of the dry docking information in in your in your book? Very likely, mm -hmm. but I'm under something of a handicap. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is to update the book yeah. from 1986 when it first came out mm -hmm. to the present time. Yeah. And at the moment, I've written 180 some thousand words <laughs> counting the old and the new. Mm -hmm. And the limit is 150,000 words. Okay. You have some trimming to so, do. Yeah, it's like cutting off part of your body to right. get rid of that. Ooh. Yeah, fair. Yeah, fair enough. So it might not be. Uh, it might not make the uh, the final version, or it might be a footnote in the uh, in the final version. You we'll know. find out. Yeah, we'll we'll certainly find out. Um, so I have to I have to ask. So you obviously um, because you, you you've written books on um, a lot of American battleships. Um, in your opinion. Uh, is the Iowa class the the pinnacle of American battleship? A lot of people say yes because they're the last ones and they're the biggest. Um, but with your research on uh, with uh, Admiral Lee and uh, his experience on Washington and everything else, um, do you have a particular favorite or uh, like a favorite battleship or a favorite class or a particular story that that you like uh, more so? Well. I, I agree with the conclusion that the Iowa class was the top of the line on American mm -hmm. battleships. Mm -hmm. There was to be a Montana class mm -hmm. uh, with 12 16-inch guns instead mm -hmm. of nine, but she did not get produced nor her intended sisters because the resources were needed for more for amphibious warfare and landing mm -hmm. craft and what have you. It's not that well known that there were two other Iowa class sisters under construction. Mm -hmm. Illinois and Kentucky. Illinois mm -hmm. and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And in 1956, the Wisconsin, a sister ship of the New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, had a collision with a destroyer. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture in my book that shows a, a look like a bite taken out of the bow of the Wisconsin. So yep. mm -hmm. the, the bow of the Kentucky. The bow of the Kentucky was grafted onto the bow of Wisconsin. Yeah. So, so that, that is an interesting picture. If when you see the when they, they they cut the bow straight off Kentucky at like sort of that certain frame bulkhead number, and then just didn't replace it, and then um, eventually Kentucky is dragged away and scrapped without a bow. But it's it's interesting that 
a piece of that ship, uh, you know, the, in incomplete Iowa lives on on Wisconsin today. Yes, it's it's, it's that that is an interesting piece of history that I know some people know, but it's um it's when you see the pictures, it's it's very interesting. It's dramatic. Uh, I pose this question to um, to Ryan himself, but maybe maybe you can shine some insight. So since because you brought it up, um, if the Montanas are built, then uh, the Montana sort of represents sort of like the traditional battleship of like the maybe like your your battle line battleship, heavier, slower, not not as slow as the previous like standard battleships. Uh, Montana can still at least do twenty eight knots on a good day, maybe if not twenty nine or thirty. But too wide to go through the Panama Canal. Very true. At this point, yeah, we're <clears throat> we, we've yeah, uh, uh, certainly I think designed to be potentially built on the West coast or at least some of them. And then they were split them up or, um, anyway, if Montana exists, uh, do you think that makes the Iowa's battle cruisers? No, in no, no way. No, in no way. <laughs> okay. Well, they had the, the battleship armor for one thing. That, sure. That's mm-hmm. the difference. Battle cruisers were not as heavily armored. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ryan and I sort of came to the same, um, conclusion uh, that while ultimately you're right i mean uh, the iowas have the armor to be certainly they are battleships um but at by world war ii standards there's very you can only armor a ship a certain amount before you, you can't put any more on certainly I mean, look, look at bismarck and yamato and even then um they're, they're not completely invulnerable especially to by you know world war ii era 16 inch shells or shells or what have you so um if you had to pick a favorite favorite ship are you gonna are you gonna go with new jersey well of course of course but uh, in second place would be the washington because that was lee's main flagship Mm -hmm. through the war yeah sadly she was scrapped uh right around 1960 and that was just at the beginning of the era of saving warships Really a misfortune that the Enterprise was scrapped uh, mm-hmm. because she did more than any other ship to win the Pacific War. Oh, absolutely. And it is a shame. Um, I do like the idea, though, that um, a little bit of CV-6 was retained for 65. And then I believe the same thing again. They're like they, they, they keep transferring that same steel up the way. And so I think I believe there will be a little bit of, uh, of CV-6 in uh, the upcoming uh was it 80 the enterprise uh enterprise three now more um, inter- more uh, organ transplants exactly exactly so a little bit of that ship will will live on well, let me say that the, mm-hmm. the north carolina fortunately was a yes the sister ship of washington mm-hmm. and i was fortunate to go on board that ship and taken up it, she also had been one of lee's flagships mm-hmm. so I was able to go into the flag quarters that Lee had occupied. Mm-hmm. Also, I, into the quarters he had occupied on New Jersey. So, just a feeling of his presence all those sure. years later to know to to be where where he was. where he was. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one other memory when I first started on the proceedings, the managing editor was a retired Marine Colonel named Herb Preston. Mm-hmm. And he got talking about Lee. He had been uh, an orderly outside Lee's cabin when Lee was a flag officer. And one night, uh, uh, Marines and uh, uh, some of the stewards perhaps got in and raided the icebox mm-hmm. and ate the remains of a chicken and then threw the evidence overboard. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the chief steward was irate. Of course, Preston told his story with a smile. Mm-hmm. And he said to the admiral, you should punish them for eating your leftover food. He said, oh, they were probably hungrier than I. And mm-hmm. that, that's a good tip off on Lee. He was not a punitive person at right. all. He, he really fit with the crew. He, they, they loved him because he was so down to earth. Mm-hmm. But the steward retaliated by putting a lock on the refrigerator after that. <laughs> uh, in your just since, um, 
since you brought back up Admiral Lee, do you, does his work on uh, like the gunnery on Washington and his work revising like the like range charts and everything else, did does that carry through um, to all the other battleships in, in World War II? Um, so, or or does that really just stay with Washington? Oh no, it, it was spread out. Mm-hmm. There was a common doctrine, and as you learn, you want everybody else to mm-hmm. know about it. The thing that separated Lee from his contemporaries was he was so technically minded and mm-hmm. he understood radar and its uses. Mm-hmm. And in his action report after the Guadalcanal battle, sinking the Kirishima, mm-hmm. he wrote, the, the only advantage we had was that we had radar and she didn't. Right. That That is such an interesting... Um, that is such an interesting battle when you think about you know, two ships of that size fighting at nearly point blank range, but at um, in the dark. And so, yeah, having this, uh, having the advantage of you're right that the, the radar being able to hit first, because really whoever hits first in that situation then has the has the upper hand. And um, Lee was certainly really uh, modest with his hit estimates, right? Um, how many how many hits did he originally? He claimed eight, mm-hmm. and subsequent research has indicated as many as twenty. Mm-hmm. The two nights before was another battle mm-hmm. involving thirteen ships and cruisers and destroyers. The Admiral Callahan was not in the ship that had the best radar. The Helena saw the Japanese coming first, mm-hmm. but Callahan wasn't ready to order fire, even mm-hmm. though he had that brief advantage. Mm-hmm. And he and Admiral Norman Scott both died in the battle. Right. So, yeah, just goes to show you. And even still, um, you know, uh, South Dakota, it's not like um, South Dakota uh, w- was was hit pretty decently um, during that in, uh, battle with Karishima as well. And so, yeah, it's just sort of a testament to Washington and uh, the gunnery. Well, of course, that was a relatively newer they're all new but um south dakota was even newer than, than washington was at that moment and so um i think she suffered what, an electrical fault and had some other issues but um the, the the destroyers there were four destroyers that were the mm-hmm. sacrificial lambs they were up front they mm-hmm. got torpedoed and hit by gunfire mm-hmm. and so they were aflame mm-hmm. and the, the washington came up and i talked to the man who was the officer of the deck, Ray Hunter. Mm -hmm. And he said, I gave the order to go to port. Mm -hmm. South Dakota was screwed up because of losing the load and she went to starboard. So the burning destroyer silhouetted her and the gunfire fell in the superstructure of South Dakota. She was just riddled and Mm -hmm. Crew members had to go up into that superstructure in yeah. the darkness to try to find the living and the dead. Yeah. You can imagine what a grif- grisly task that was. Right. I talked to one of the men who'd been a turret officer, Commander Paul Backus, mm-hmm. and he, years later, was in the cruiser Huntington when Arlie Burke commanded her. Mm-hmm. And the uh, chief petty officer came to him who had been on that detail in the South Dakota and he said he had nightmares and he'd sometimes his wife would wake him up because he'd have his hands around her neck and he was reliving that experience in his dreams well Bacchus got him hooked up with the naval hospital and a psychiatrist Mm -hmm. and resolved what the problem was Mm -hmm. And that was the cure. So there's, there's a lot of interesting stories connected yeah. with the ships. Mm-hmm. Um, are you surprised that uh, someone like Lee didn't spend more time on the larger battleships like New Jersey or when, when they became available? It was interesting that Lee decided to, you know, to stay with Washington, a ship that he obviously had spent a lot of time on and became very attached to. But were you surprised? Um, that he didn't graduate to an Iowa, so to speak. No, and you raise an interesting point. Mm-hmm. 
Lee was in part the father of the Combat Information Center concept. Mm -hmm. He understood radar and they developed a space in what had been his sea cabin mm -hmm. up in the superstructure and had a, a radar repeater in there. Mm -hmm. It was still so primitive, they didn't have one on the bridge, but they had phone communication. Mm -hmm. And that was helpful to Lee in commanding mm -hmm. the guns and so forth. And uh, so that became his favorite. Mm -hmm. And he he liked the setup and he went back. So because it was in the superstructure by in versus being like in the armored citadel or someplace, it's, he felt like he was closer to the action. Is that what? Oh, sure. Yeah, right. Well, he was closer to the information and he could yeah. correlate what he was seeing mm -hmm. with what he was hearing. Mm -hmm. And the CIC in the New Jersey was down in the fourth deck. Yeah, that wouldn't have been very fun for him. <laughs> well, no, he had to be on the bridge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Though, interestingly, mm -hmm. when the New Jersey was reactivated and modernized, she got missiles, harpoon and tomahawk. Mm -hmm. And now the captain's battle station is in the combat engagement center, mm -hmm. which wiped out the old flag quarters. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a safety officer on the bridge, but the captain gets that picture seeing mm -hmm. it firsthand. Um, if you're interested in um, Battleship Commander and um, Admiral Lee, uh, really do encourage anyone in the audience um, to, to go ahead and pick up a copy. Um, that's a, certainly a, a really wonderful work and sort of your life's, a, a life work for you, Paul. And uh, we're certainly um, really looking forward to having the, the Battleship New Jersey book. Um, we, did, um, we did an interview with uh, Bill Garski a couple months ago um, and uh, they're um, revising the Allied and Axis battleships. So there's a little bit of a revival here in uh, the Naval Institute Press's uh, uh, large battleship books, and we're certainly uh, really uh, looking forward to yours. Well, Whatever. battleships literature and mm -hmm. films and all never seems to go out of fashion. No, people people love it. There's just a, a presence to it that you know the people uh, people absolutely love, and something that's unmatched in other in other ship classes, even with carriers. You know, even as the Gerald R. Ford's, you know, hundred plus thousand tons and eleven hundred plus feet long. It's just there's just still not the same as you know, the, the big gun, you know, and that power projection that those bring. And uh, that's what Ryan always says, at least, what, what kept them around for so long. So Majesty, mystique. Absolutely. I rode the, I had the good fortune of riding the Missouri mm -hmm. into Pearl Harbor for the 50th anniversary in mm -hmm. 1991. And uh, there was a reporter on board uh, from the St. Louis paper, mm -hmm. and he wrote in an article when the battleship arrives, it's just as if Princess Diana had come in. Mm -hmm. All eyes are on her. Right. And I remember that trip so well. We went across the southern coast of Oahu, mm -hmm. and it was just coming up dawn. Saw the sun coming up over Diamond Head. Hundreds of flashes from people on shore taking mm -hmm. pictures made the turn going into the channel and we passed by where those battleships had been mm -hmm. in 1941. Yeah. And in my mind's eye, I could see the smoke coming up from watching newsreels. Sure. And then we passed the Arizona Memorial and mm -hmm. it just, it was a very emotional experience. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty incredible. That experience for sure. I was, you know, you, you were at least underway. I, I'm like, I'm sitting here, holding my fingers crossed to be able to at least catch a ride on New Jersey <laughs> when, when she's being towed up the river for a few miles, you know, that, that sort of experience of, uh, of just lightly being underway <laughs> for just a little bit, even, you know, even though you're being towed or pushed along, I guess, um, in, in her case, but wow. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Well, thank you, Jack, for I, the opportunity. Yeah, this is wonderful. And thank you for so much for coming in and, uh, and talk, sitting down and talking to us for a little bit. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you leave us a comment down below um, and I'll do my best to, to read uh, to read them all and to get back to you. And uh, if uh, you have any questions for Paul, um, you can put them down below as well. And uh, Paul, if you know, if anyone uh, comes back with anything, I'll, uh, I'll let you know.
All right. And can, again, so can we make an insertion? Sure. I think you were asking about foreign battleships. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. What you got? <laughs> <laughs> the the King George V class, of course, was very famous in the Royal Navy. Mm -hmm. And the one battleship that came after that class was HMS Vanguard, mm -hmm. which was commissioned too late to be in World War II. Vanguard is kind of a, a greatest hits of uh, British battleships. You know, you get the older World War I style guns and the, the later, you know, superstructure and then that the sort of like the modified lion hull form. And it's, it's interesting. Back during the era of the Falklands War, 1982, mm -hmm. I had an assignment to find lessons learned for the U.S. Navy from that experience. Mm -hmm. So I went to the British Embassy mm -hmm. and visited with the Royal Navy attache, Captain Reed, mm -hmm. who told me he had been an ensign on board Vanguard when she was early in commission. Mm -hmm. now, this is living history right here. Mm -hmm. And I so lament that as with the Enterprise, the Vanguard was scrapped. Oh, absolutely. And I have been to London, and the, the World War II ship which has mm -hmm. been preserved mm -hmm. is uh, HMS Belfast, mm -hmm. which was in on the D-Day landing, mm -hmm. and she was in on the Battle of North Cape, mm -hmm. helping to sink the Scharnhorst. Mm -hmm. Also, while in England, my wife Karen and I went to the Royal Navy Dockyard at Portsmouth, mm -hmm. and what a treat. Right, yeah. We saw their HMS Warrior mm -hmm. commissioned in 1860 as the first ironclad warship. Mm -hmm. uh, still had the full rig of sails and what have you. Uh, but she, she was the progenitor of that type. Mm -hmm. Two years later, she was outmoded when mm -hmm. the Monitor came along right. and the Virginia. But as we strode below decks in uh, Warrior, we came across a stateroom from one of the officers, and it had the name Lieutenant J.A. Fisher. Well, 40 years after he served in that ship, he was the first Sea Lord at mm -hmm. the beginning of the 20th century. Wow. Mm -hmm. And he was the progenitor of a ship, HMS Dreadnought. Mm. <laughs> and what a legacy. Right, absolutely. Ever after, the, the all big gun battleship have comes been back known to, as Dreadnoughts. Right, absolutely. All, they all come back to Dreadnought in some form. And then even, but not just the battleship, that, uh, that whole concept um, applied to cruisers and it just kind of spread out all over. But yes, no, you're absolutely right, especially pertaining to battleships. So what a legacy. Yes. Well, um, as your own, as, as your as your legacy, uh, thank you, Paul, so much for, for joining us. It's always a pleasure. And maybe we'll have to do this again sometime in the future. Well, I once, hope so. <laughs> once the book comes out, maybe we could, we'll do a follow up. Great. And, uh, you know, and, and provide a little bit more insight there and be able to, to hold something in our hands. OK. All right. Well, and thank you all so much for watching. And again, if you have any comments for Paul or for myself, um, just leave them down below. And uh, everyone, have a good day. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you, Jack. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul.